Peter chapter 1. I hope you heard the words of that song. I think we've been so blessed in America, sometimes we forget how blessed we've been. Um, if you've ever been overseas, we are teenagers, teenagers, hey, this is not, ch- not playtime, this is church time. Now, I'll respect you if you all respect me. But don't, don't test me on this. I'll call you out in a heartbeat. Um, I've preached to several thousand teenagers at one time, and they'll sit there and listen. I expect that in church. This is church time. Now, listen to me. Listen to me. I, if you've never been overseas, never been overseas, you don't understand how blessed we are in America. We are blessed in this nation. We are tremendously blessed. I just think of our homes that we live in. You know, the worst homes in America sometimes are the our mansions overseas. And we just don't understand it. And I, I think sometimes we just kind of, we let the news media form our thinking, oh, how bad we have it in America. Oh, no. You better thank God a thousand times over that God allowed you to be born here. Um, we, have a, we have a wonder. We're, we're, born, we're not a perfect nation, but we're born in a great nation. And we ought to be thankful for that. Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. Once you've found it, let's all stand as we read the word of God. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have attained like precious faith with, with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, And hath forgotten that he was purged from his own sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election, sir. For if you, if if ye do these things, notice what he says, ye shall, what's the next word? Never fall. I want to take these verses right here, and I want you to leave your... Leave, leave, the, leave God's word open tonight. You might want to keep a pen out, because I want to have you, I want to explain some of these things to you. Um, I want to speak tonight on the subject, avoiding the casualty list. Avoiding the casualty list. Father, allow me to help your people tonight. Lord, I thank you for what you've done today. But Lord, if we just stopped right now and said we're not going to go any further, we would have failed because your word is open. Your word needs to be preached. I pray that everyone would listen. God, I'm asking you in a special way, speak to hearts. I don't know what the needs are. I don't know why you want me to preach this one tonight. Lord, help us, please. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. One of the most heartbreaking things that I've ever had to deal with in the ministry is hearing about a brother or sister in Christ who has fallen in sin. I, I, I never get over it. I remember one time several years ago, my wife and I, we went on a, we went on a spell of almost, almost every three weeks we were hearing about it, somebody else who's fallen in sin. My wife and I, I mean, we looked at each other and we said to each other, is it, is, are there more people falling or is it that I'm just getting older and I'm learning more? I, is my ministry just, just broadened enough that I'm, I'm learning? About, I, I, didn't, I couldn't figure it out. But, it, it's, but every time, it was like a weight. It was, like a, it was, it was a load on my heart because I, I, never, I never rejoice. You know, when David heard that King Saul fell, 
He was not like the average believer in 2019 that wants to put it on YouTube and Facebook and say, this person's done this, we gotta make him an outcast. David was the complete opposite. David said, publish it not. Publish it not. You say, oh, you're, you're trying to cover sin. No, I'm trying to restore the fallen. I'm not interested in trying to throw someone under the bus and where they can never be used again. Let me just make this very clear. If, 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 if you're alive and you've fallen in sin, there's nothing you can do that can forfeit the right for God to use you in some way in the church. As long as you're breathing air, you still have hope that God can use you again. When I hear of preachers falling, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart when I hear of fellow believers in the church who has fallen. Let me just make a couple of statements to you. It's never good news to hear that someone has fallen. Did you hear me? Never. It should never thrill your heart when an enemy has fallen. It ought to break your heart. You know, I have preachers around the country, some of them I don't agree with, but listen, okay, I'll give you a classic example. I read the other day, a couple weeks ago, where a national pastor in a different, whole different denomination fell. And I'll be honest with you, it did, it, I didn't rejoice over it. It didn't make me happy. It hurt me. You say, but he doesn't believe like us. It doesn't matter. I don't want anybody to fall. Because I know, I know the depths of the, of the, that thing that the fingers of sin go and how it hurts. I just don't want it to happen. I'm saying it's never good news to hear that someone has fallen. I'll say this next statement. You should never spread the news that someone has fallen. Let me, let me, let me tell you how it works. They go to someone and say, hey, can, can I tell you something? Don't tell anybody else, but I want you to pray for them. No, you're wanting to gossip. Come on now. It's not the whole world. I tell people all the time, you don't have to confess your sins to me. I, I, I'm not God. Come on now. And now I'll try to help you out of your sin, but I don't need to know what your sin is to help you out. The, getting people out of sin is really pretty easy if you follow the word of God. You see, we're wanting to find out the dirt. And by the way, God says, take heed lest ye fall. I, fe I fear we're trying to figure out what everybody's doing and we're setting ourselves up to make the same fall that they've done because we're polluting our mind. The reason why Adam and Eve fell, it was not that they, it was not that they didn't know good. It was that they learned bad from Satan and it was the knowledge of evil that has destroyed this world. Listen to me. It's never good news to hear someone's fallen. You should never spread the news someone has fallen. Next statement. You should never think that you're above falling. Huh? You know, can I just kind of tell you, and this is all introductory to get us to where we're going in our sermon. Can I just remind you that the, that the scripture says that Satan is after the precious soul. He's out after the one who's doing, why? Because they have a precious soul. Now, let me ask you a question. Just because they've fallen, does that mean that they're not a precious soul? Come on now. You say, but they fell. Yes, okay, and you haven't done wrong? Now, listen to me. At some point, you got to be careful that you don't think, well, I'm better than them. Oh, no. You're one step away from the same um, casualty step that others have taken. Everybody is capable of falling. Next statement, Satan's after you. I can promise you this. If you're doing anything for God, you got a target on your back. Sunday school teachers, you got a target on your back. Hey, deacons, you got a target on your back. Hey, assistant pastors, you got a target on your back. Hey, church member, you got a target on your back. Hey, bus workers, you got a target on your back. Hey, so winner, you got a target on your back. Hey, preacher, you got a target on your back. Everybody, if you're doing something for God, you're, you're helping keeping people out of hell, helping people's lives be turned around. I'm telling you, I don't care if you're a male. I don't care if you're a female. I'm saying tonight, hey, you better watch out. Satan's after you. 
He's a real enemy. He's a real person who's trying to destroy you, and you better beware. Hey, God says, he says, beware. You adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. He, he doesn't care your age. He doesn't care if you're a teenager. He doesn't care if you're in your 70s. He just wants you to fall. Why? Because he hates your God. Which leaves the next statement. You should take inventory of someone's fall to correct your problems in life. When I see that someone has fallen, and if I know them, I try to learn from their fall, get this now, so I don't make the same steps. You with me so far? Why? Because I don't want to fall. Now, I want you to notice, I just want to point out a couple observations about this verse. When God, when Peter begins to talk, he talks about his faith. Look at verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have attained like precious faith. I want you to circle those words. Precious, the value, uh, I want you to circle the words precious faith. Put this beside it. It's a valuable faith. It's a valuable faith. Why must we keep from falling? Because the faith that we're living, Brother Williams, is a valuable faith. Do you say, what's so valuable about our faith? It's our faith that can keep people from going to hell. It's our faith that can turn lives around. It's our faith that can help people um, go down the right road and become fruitful in their Christian life. It's a valuable faith. You say, how valuable is it? It's as valuable that as Jesus Christ leaving heaven, coming to earth, dying on the cross, shedding his blood, being buried, and rising again. Hey, that's why it's so valuable. Why? Because there's the power of Christ's blood in it. That's why. I want you to notice something else. I want you to go to verse 3. He says, according as his divine power. I want you to circle the word divine power that's given unto us. So and I want you to notice the power of faith. So we see the value of faith in verse 1. In verse 2, we see the, we, we, as we look, or in verse 3, we see the, 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 the divine power of faith. What's it do? Oh, it changes people. It's a powerful faith. Thank God. I don't have a dead faith. You can go to Buddha's tomb. He's dead. You can go to Muhammad's tomb. He's dead. You can go to Joseph Smith's tomb. He's dead. You go to Christ's tomb, it's empty. He's alive. Hey, powerful faith. So we have, we have right here, we've got, first of all, a valuable faith. Then we've got a powerful faith. Then I want you to notice this in verse 4. He says in verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. I want you to notice the favor of our faith. The favor of our faith. You say, what, what do you mean by that? the favor? Oh, because of our faith, God gives us great and precious promises. You say, what are these precious promises? Well, I'll give you a couple. Call unto me, and I will answer thee. And so the great and mighty things which thou knowest not, that's a promise from God. Why? Because of our faith. Hey, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a promise from God. Listen to me, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall mean given. That's a power. Hey, that's a promise. Oh, the favor that God gives his people, his children. Why? Because of our faith. Listen, you got a valuable faith. You got a powerful faith. You got a faith, a favor of faith. But then I want you to notice we have a partner in our faith in verse 4. Look what he says in verse 4. He says that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through love. He say, who is the partakers of the divine nature? Who's our partner in faith? Listen to me. You're in business with God. Listen to me. I've got news for you tonight. Alan Dom, this is not Alan Domley's church. This is the Lord's church. I just happen to be in business with him. Come on now. Do you understand? Hey, because we're all members of this thing together, those who are members of this church, hey, you're in business with God tonight. Come on now. That means tonight, hey, Brother Desmond, I'm not in business with somebody who's failed. I'm in business with somebody who conquered death, came out of the grave, and is in heaven right now. And one day he's going to come on this earth on a white horse, and he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years and take us to heaven. Hey, thank God, I'm in business with the Almighty God tonight. 
But notice, he says, we have a valuable faith. He says we have a powerful faith. He says our faith, that our faith gives us favor. He says we have a partner in faith, but may I, just, may I just remind you, Satan is after your faith. He's after it. Why? Because if he can destroy your faith, listen very carefully, he destroys your confidence, he destroys your testimony, which then destroys your ability to be a witness. Brother Hargill, you know what gives us the confidence that we have? What gives us the confidence is, by God's grace, we've not fallen as of yet. That's what allows Brother Harjo up here on Sunday mornings to go up to people who've been saved and have the confidence. There's not, listen to me, sin always, put, that's, the hard, that's the hardest thing to try to help people when they're recovering from sin is to remove that question, that doubt in their mind. Can God use me? What's people going to think about me? Let me tell you something. Don't worry what people are going to think about you. God's forgiving you. Now forgive yourself. Let's move on. Get the confidence. Hey, God can use you. Okay, so if I have such a great faith, then what do I do about it? How, what's the answer to not falling? Look at verse 5. And beside this, giving all, what's the next word? Diligence. Then I want you to circle the next word. What's the next word? Add. I hate to bring school into this. You ready? This is deep. Adding is opposite of subtracting. Did you get that? Making sure the blondes, I'm sorry. Uh, but anyway, adding is the opposite of subtracting. God says add to your faith. Listen to me. Faith is an action word. It's not an inaction. You don't have faith to sit. You have faith to serve. Faith is an action. So get this now. You're either in action or you're, you're, either, you're, you're either acting or you're not acting. Your faith is it's an action or it's an inaction. But listen to me for the, okay, the Christian walk. I'm either, am I faith? I'm either walking in faith or I'm sitting in doubt. You with me so far? Twice, I'm trying to get some of you to come out on Saturdays at 930. Why? Trying to get you to act, trying to get some action in your faith. I'm glad you're in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. That's wonderful, but add, add to your faith. Why? So you don't fall. Because listen to me, God says if you, you want to keep from falling, you've got to add to your what? Faith. What type of faith? A valuable faith. What type of faith? A powerful faith. What type of faith? A faith of favor. What type of faith? A faith that partners with Christ. He says add to that faith several things. Here's what, we got, what we're going to add. Follow me very carefully. Here comes the sermon. He says, and add to your faith, what's the first word? Virtue. Circle the word virtue. Put this beside it. Moral excellence. Moral excellence. Listen to me. There's two types of, ex that, uh, two types of morality we ought to have. It's a mental morality and a physical morality. Now listen to me, before you ever commit the physical sin, you've already committed it mentally. That's why, listen to me, man, that's why you better get control of your pornography and you better get rid of it. Why? Because the pornography is one step away from the physical step of committing the sin. You say, well, I've not committed it. Oh, but you're not far. It's just as right, listen to me, it's just as right to be uh, mentally pure as it is to be physically pure. We tell our young people, teenagers, listen to me, this is what your preacher wants. I want you to walk down the aisle as a virgin. Say, why? It's what God wants. You don't have to be like, listen to me, we don't have to act like a, bar, a bunch of barnyard animals running around and losing the purity, acting like it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. Listen to me. You only have your virginity one time. Once you lose it, you can never get it back. 
And all these people, listen to me, young person, all these people in school who brag about losing their purity and their virginity, and you're still pure, you can look at them and say, listen, okay, um, you don't, um, I have my virginity, you don't, you can't get it back. I have something that's more valuable. Why? You can never have what I have, and I can have what you have any day I choose to, but I choose not to. Why? I want to stay pure. Any day we can commit adultery. Any day you can commit fornication. Any day you can go into sin. Listen to me, it's a choice. You know what that means? Keep your hands off each other. You're not married, keep your hands off each other. Listen, teenagers, six inch rule. I, when, I was, when I was the president of the Bible college down south, I stopped the six inch rule. He said, what would you do that for? Because I made a better rule. Have room for Jesus. Jesus better be able to sit between you and every picture that I see. I better be able to see a room for Jesus between you. And you say, how big is God? Somebody help me out. I better see a gap there. Mom and dad, you can help me out just a little bit. I'm trying to help you out. And just because the table's covering your legs doesn't make it right. Well, amen, preacher. Good preaching. Just keep it going. We live in a day, oh, you know, we got we, we to gotta find out if we're compatible. Hogwash. You got to find out if you're a friend. Because your your friend, listen to me, marriages exist on friendship, on friendship. You better get your friendship taken care of, teenager. Every married person will tell you the other star, other side all takes care of itself. You better become a friend to who you're about ready to marry. Well, I don't plan on marrying them, then why are you dating them? I tell young people all the time, listen to me, if you don't want your children to turn out like them, you better drop them like a hot potato. I, I ask young men who are dating a girl, do you want, you want your children, you want your girl to turn out? No, then why are you dating her? I ask young ladies, young ladies, do you want your, do you want your boys to turn out like that guy that you're dating? Oh, no way, then why are you dating them? Well, I may be single the rest of my life. It's better to be single than turn out like that. Come on now. God says, add to your faith virtue. What's that? Moral excellence. Then he said, he continues on, add to your virtue what? Knowledge. Circle the word knowledge. Put this beside it, spiritual insight. Spiritual insight. So God says, okay, you got a faith. You got saved. You're on your way to heaven. It's a salvation that you don't, you don't, you don't have it today. Lose it tomorrow. It's a salvation you always have. Now, add to that faith the virtue, that moral excellence. And add to that, 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 that virtue some knowledge. Get some spiritual insight. You say, what's that mean? You get insight from God's word. That means you got to read God's word. You got to study God's word. You got to memorize God's word. You got to apply God's word. Listen to me. Get in God's word every day. He said, where do I get God's mind? You get God's mind by walking with God in his word. Well, I just don't have time. Oh, I think you have time. But you've been up to, to 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning playing your games, and if you go to bed, you might find you could get up early enough to read the word of God. Listen. I... It's, it's no secret. I get up 4.30 every morning. You say, why do you get up that early? Because i got to get some spiritual insight. Now, let me help you out. My family will, ver will validate this. About 9.30 at night, I'm shutting down. Now, they'll say a little bit earlier, and don't you all lie now. But anyway, but about 9.30 at night, Brother Means, I just start shutting down. And when I say shut down, when I shut down, it goes down fast. Anybody that's, ever, anybody that's ever come to my house, they'll know a certain time, I'll say, well, been good. 
And I jump up out of the seat. You know what that means? Get out of my house. Because I'm about ready to go to bed. Come on now. You get up at 4.30 in the morning. You say, why did you get up? Oh, I've got to have some spiritual insight. Brother Weiss, I want to, I want to be able to walk with God. I want to get that mind of God. I want his mind to infiltrate my mind. Why? So I can have some moral excellence. He says, add to your faith, virtue. Virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance. Circle the word temperance. Put this beside it, self-control. Self-control. Listen to me. You don't have to lose your temper. It's a choice. Well, I just got ticked off. And unwind your clock and don't get ticked off. I'm just having a bad day. Well, then go back to bed and wake up about a minute later and have a good day. Listen. Self-control. Only time Alan Domley loses his temper is when he's not being temperate with his attitude. Temperance. Then God says, add to your, he says, add, he says, add to temperance, what? Patience. Once you circle the word patience, put this beside it, staying power. Staying power. What's that mean? Don't quit. Don't quit. Too many people are jumping when they just need to stay, just stay where you are. Stop jumping. Listen to me. Instability always leads to sin. That's why I'm trying to get everybody to come to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Why? That creates stability. My wife and daughter, they know I am like a machine. I do the same thing, same time every day. I would eat the same meal every day if my wife cooked it. You say, you say it worked yesterday, it'll work today. My breakfast hasn't changed in years. Bacon, praise, anything's good with bacon. You can say amen on that one. Bacon, then you get, she, she fries the eggs, but she pops those eyeballs, those yellow eyeballs in that thing. Because I don't want stuff running on my plate. <laughs> then she gets some toast and she, I mean, she, she, she lathers that thing in, in butter. Lathers it. I mean, she puts so much butter on that. I mean, it's, it's, it's going through the other side. You say, that's going to give you cholesterol. You're going to die of a heart attack. Yeah, but I'll die happy. Nothing worse. I went to Starbucks. I was going to try. Who was that? Was I with you, Brother Tremble, when I got that green drink? Oh, my word. Let me help you out. Don't ever drink anything green. Man, I got that. I thought, oh, they, you know, they're, they're bragging about this green drink, Brother Williams, and I got this green drink. I thought I was chewing on some grass out in the field. I almost started mooing. It's like, who would buy this stuff? I, I told Brother Tim, I said, don't ever. Did I, I said, I tried to get him to drink. He goes, no. <laughs> Sissy. I think we ought to do that on blast on Wednesday night. See what you want. These teenagers can do that. But anyway, listen. I mean, listen, I'd rather be a cow than drink that green stuff. Man, just give, I mean, just listen to me. You say, what, what does that have to do with the sermon? Nothing. I was just thinking about it. I'm just saying, at some point, got to have some staying power. Stay. You know what I appreciate about Mrs. O'Daniel? A lot of pastor's wives would have left, but she stayed. And she's not just stayed. She's got a good spirit while she is staying. Now her, son, her son's spirit stinks, but anyway... Sorry about that. Listen to me. Staying power. At some point, you just got to say, okay, I've got to have some. Listen, it takes patience not to quit. Then God says, add to patience, what? Godliness. Shook with the word godliness, put this beside it, an awareness of God. An awareness of God. So what do you mean? 
If you don't want to fall, you better have an awareness in your mind. Everything that I'm doing, God is watching, God is listening, and God is there. Listen to me, sir. Your wife may not know your passcode to your cell phone. But, you know, God doesn't need the passcode. God does, he's, done, he's already seen you hiding that. Somebody help me out. And I'm talking tonight that, that God's people need an awareness of God that everywhere we go, no matter where we are, hey, God's there. Well, we're at home. You know, we can just kind of let up at home. No, no, you can't. God's there. Why is it, listen, why is it that when the preacher comes to your house, it sounds like a bunch of mice running around? And you hear, turn it off, turn it off. Get rid of it. Hide it, hide it. I say, Brother Williams, it's okay. Do you know before the preacher ever got there, do you understand God was already there? An awareness of God. Oh, how America needs an old-fashioned stirring of an awareness of God in their life. He says, add to godliness. I wish God wouldn't have added this one. Brotherly kindness. Circle the words brotherly kindness. Put this beside it. Getting along. Listen, OU fans and OSU fans. Get along. I don't know where that one came from, but get along. No? No? It's okay. Listen to me. Roll tide. But anyway. <laughs> listen. You know, you know, this brotherly kindness means with your spouse. Hate to tell the hard Joes this, but you get you're supposed to get along with each other. Just thought I'd let you know. You're welcome. Listen. You know, you know, brothers and sisters, that means you're supposed to get along with your brother and sister. Come on now. Why is it that mom and dad are a referee inside the house because you can't get along? Well, I, they're just a jerk. Man, have you looked in the mirror? Come on now. Get along. Getting along is a choice. You know, my, my brother and my sisters and I all got along. You know why? Because if we didn't, mom had a way to make sure we got along. We chose to get along so we wouldn't get a whooping. Somebody say amen. amen. Mom and dad would say, listen to me. Listen to me. You all better get along because if you don't, I'll give you a reason to get along. Okay. I love you, brother. <laughs> you know, in the church, we can get along. We can get along. You know, there's a lot of different personalities in the church, but we can get along. Then he says, there's one other thing that will keep you from falling. He says, add to brother, he says, add to brother kindness, charity. Circle the word charity, put this beside it, loving the lost. Loving the lost. You know why your preacher pushes soul winning so much? One is the heartbeat of God. Second, I know this. If you'll just go out and go so winning, you'll get your eyes off yourself. You have a better chance not to fall in sin. There's something about it. And I don't know what it is. Brother Melvin, there's something about when I go out so winning, I completely forget about me. And you know what's funny? I don't ever recall being tempted to do wrong while I'm out so winning. I just don't. 
Uh, you just think so when he's an answer for everything. It, it, it probably is. I know we live in a day where preachers are trying to downplay the importance of soul winning. Let me help you out. Thank God we're in a church here that doesn't downplay it. We make it important. Not trying to excuse away people getting saved. We're just saying, hey, it's as easy as trusting Christ. Well, you know, we don't want this one, two, three, pray after me, green fruit. I don't know what green fruit is. I just know this. People put the trust in Christ, they're saved. Well, we got to make sure they mean it. And you're the Holy Ghost? Isn't it funny? Someone cries, we think they get saved. Oh, they really meant it. Someone who doesn't cry, oh, they, they probably didn't mean it. That, and the one that didn't cry is the one that comes to church. Stop trying to be the Holy Ghost. And why don't you just decide, okay, I'm not going to be, I'm going to, I'm just going to get a love for the lost. Go so winning. And try to tell people how to get saved. Why do we do all that? We do it for one reason. For if you do these things, ye shall never. You don't say, well, I tried most of them and I fell. God says these things, all of them. You do them all. You won't fall. Anytime someone falls is when one of these things. You say, how do you put a life back together? By putting these things back in. I put these things back in, they will no longer fall. They get their life back together. Let me ask you a question. I'm done. What are you lacking tonight? You don't have to tell me. What's the Holy Spirit poked your heart about? First of all, do you even have a faith? Are you saved? If you died tonight, are you 100% sure you go to heaven? Say, I don't know that. Then this is the night to get it settled. If you are saved, then you better make sure these things are in part of your life. Because if not, you're a candidate to fall. Father, Father.